Last week, we began a new uh, message series called Major Marriage Myths That Will Mess You Up. And so what we did is we, we introduced this box of hopes, dreams, and desires because all of us, as we enter into a marriage, we have some ideas of uh, what our future should look like. For instance, we have some ideas of uh, how much money we're going to make and who's going to work and uh, how long they're going to work. And we have an idea of uh, how many kids we're going to have. We're going to have one, two, three. We have an idea of what kind of car we're going to drive and all the kids are going to fit in here. They're going to ride back here. Uh, We got uh, what kind of house we're going to live in, we're going to rent, we're going to buy. We uh, have an idea of uh, household chores, how they're going to be done. We have an idea of uh, where we're going to spend holidays and how we're going to spend our time. We have an idea of what she will or will not wear to uh, sleep in (laughs) right here. And uh, we have an idea of how we're going to resolve conflict. So all of these things, we have an idea about what our future should look like. And those ideas almost always center around what's in our box of hopes, dreams, and desires. And and I'm going to just say that's natural. That's, That's a normal thing. The challenge is when we get married, we merge our life with someone else, someone very different from us. And guess what they have? They have their own box of hopes, dreams, and desires. And for some of us, that was a real shock, wasn't it? Because before most of us get married, we don't sit around thinking about being the perfect person for someone else. No, we imagine and we fantasize how great it will be to find the perfect person for me. And it takes us a while, but after a few months, a great revelation comes to us. It is a literal matrimonial epiphany. And it's this, we are not just working out of my box. We are not just working out. The person I married has their own hopes, dreams, and desires. And get this, they think I'm supposed to help fulfill their box. How messed up is that, right? It's like the husband who was so selfish that when he won a trip for two to Hawaii, he went twice. (laughs) That's funny to me. Someone has said that at your wedding, you vow to become one, and as your marriage plays out, you find out which one. (laughs) You see, here's what we talked about. These boxes of hopes, dreams, and desires quickly have a way of becoming expectations. And expectations are the strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. Well, we're not there yet. But we're moving in that direction, right, honey? It's this subtle but constant pressure that eventually, and not right now, but sooner or later, things are going to be what I imagine they would be, and he'll come around, and she'll finally see that doing it the way I want, in other words, living out of my box is the best way to live. And this is what we called the expectations myth. It is, and here's what we said about that. Unrealistic expectations can ruin relationships and at the same time reveal our ultimate hope if we let them. So I just want to say this to you. If you missed last week, I I urge you to to watch the message, to listen to it uh, online at journeychristian.com or or through our our app. It's one of the most relationship damaging myths out there is the expectations myth because we're all susceptible to it because this box, at least mentally, just kind of always seems to hang around the marriage. Now today, we're going to talk about another myth related to our box analogy. And I want to set this up by saying this is a myth that Melinda, my wife and I, we heard this as soon as we announced our engagement. I never will forget this. We were at a large family gathering on my side of the family. And one of my uncles said this to us, He said, now listen, he said, I'm going to give you some marriage advice. He said, you're going to do fine in marriage as long as you remember that marriage is 50-50. Anybody ever tell you that? (laughs) Marriage is 50-50. You do your part and she does her part and everything's going to work out fine. Now, this line of thinking usually stems from somebody who's figured out there are two boxes in marriage. 
and recognizing that there are two boxes in every marriage and understanding that nobody gets everything in their box all the time. You need to make sure you're winning some of the time and that she's winning some of the time because nobody wins all the time. Therefore, the conclusion is marriage is a 50-50 deal where we compromise and we give in occasionally, but as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, whatever that means, and they're doing what they're supposed to do, then your marriage will make it. You will survive your marriage. And isn't that the goal? I'm going to endure you, baby, until death do us part if it kills me, right? That's what we signed up for, right? Heard about a little boy who asked his dad, he said, Daddy, how much does it cost to get married? The dad said, I don't know yet. I'm still paying. <laughs> the problem with this view is it turns marriage, listen, here's what we said, it turns marriage into a debt-debtor relationship. And here's at the heart, here's what's at the heart of this debt-debtor relationship. It's an unspoken, but this is a very real sentiment. You owe me. You owe me. That's what husbands are supposed to do. That's what wives are supposed to do. And so what do we do? We start to negotiate and bribe. Hey, uh, uh, you do this my way and I'll do this your way, right? And we go back and forth. We, 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 try, to, we, we, we try to monitor each other. And, and on every one of these issues, we start to keep score. And, and we start to look at who's given and who's taken. And we want to make sure that I'm not giving too much and she's taking too much. Our goal is to be equal and fair because we're 21st century Americans and we want to ensure that nobody's being taken advantage of. And if we're not careful, we end up with this debt debtor model of marriage. But here's the problem with this model of marriage. Now, now think about this. Think about this carefully. When someone owes you something, they can't give you something. Now think about that. You understand that? When someone owes you something, they can't get, for example, you're, you're an employee and your boss says, hey, Bobby, come into the office. I have a special gift I want to give you. And he hands you your envelope of your pay from last week's work. And you wouldn't say, oh man, that is wonderful. Thank you so much, boss. You are so generous and so kind. Is that what you say when you get paid what you're owed? No, you say, oh boss, this really isn't a gift. This is payment for services rendered. This is what you owe me. We have a contractual agreement. I work so many hours for you. You pay me so much money for that work. You see, that's how contracts work. And this gets us to the heart of what we want to talk about today that in my mind just explodes this whole 50-50 myth. Friends, there's a huge difference between viewing marriage as a contract and viewing marriage as a covenant. There is a huge, huge difference. Now, to understand marriage as a covenant, we have to go back to one of the earliest sources where this idea was first taught, and that would be the Bible, because the fact is the God of the Bible is a covenant God. The Bible itself is a covenant book, and those who choose the life of a follower of Jesus Christ, we are a covenant people. Moses put it this way, to the Israelites in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. He said, know therefore that the Lord your God, he is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love, very important words, to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. Covenant is how God chose to demonstrate his love and his desire to relate to his creation. Respected Bible teacher K. Arthur says, the concept of covenant like a crimson thread is woven throughout God's word from Genesis to Revelation. Now in our culture, we're not as familiar with the concept of covenant. We're more familiar with the concept of a contract, but a covenant is not a contract. What's the difference? Let's talk through some. A contract is about legal legalities and leverage. A covenant is about love and loyalty. A contract engages the services of people. Covenants engage the hearts of people. A contract calls for the signing of names. A covenant calls for the binding of hearts. A contract is focused on results. A covenant's focused on relationships. A contract is consumer-based. A covenant is commitment-based. A contract is enforced by a court. A covenant is enforced by character. Now, now, you may be saying, well, if covenant is so foundational 
to the Bible. Can you give me some examples of that from the Bible? Thank you for asking. Be happy to. <laughs> you ever hear of a guy named Noah? The word covenant first appears in the Bible. Genesis 6, 18, in the story of Noah. God told Noah, build an ark, save yourself, your family from a flood. And then he said this, but I'm going to establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And following the flood, God made another covenant with Noah. He promised never to destroy the earth by a flood again. And he gave Noah and his descendants the sign of a rainbow. And every time we see a rainbow, it reminds us of God's covenant with Noah and the fact that God's promises are always true. You see, the covenant that God made with Noah was a covenant of life preservation. Ever hear of a guy named Abraham? God made a covenant with him. God told Abraham to leave his homeland, go to the land he would show them, and he would make his descendants into a great nation that would bless all peoples on earth. But several years passed, no children were born to the aging Abraham and his wife, Sarah. They began to doubt God's promise, and they did some desperate, bizarre things that tried to help God out that included another woman to be a surrogate mother. But God appeared to Abraham in a vision and assured him that he and Sarah would have a son, even in their old age. And from that yet-to-be-born child, Abraham's descendants would be no more numerous than stars in the sky and sands on the shores. And God confirmed his promise to Abraham by entering a covenant with him. Genesis 15, 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. The sign of God's covenant with Noah was a rainbow. However, the sign of God's covenant with Abraham was circumcision, to which Abraham probably replied, Noah got a rainbow. <laughs> I want a rainbow. Can't we have like a secret handshake or something? The covenant that God made with Abraham was a covenant of future blessing. Ever hear of a guy named Moses? God made a covenant with Israel. The physical descendants of Abraham through a man named Moses. The Mosaic Covenant is most commonly called the law in the Bible. These were laws given to govern the civil, civil ceremonial, the moral, and spiritual practices of the nation of Israel. By keeping the law, Israel could indicate its acceptance of its covenant relationship with God. Exodus 19, verse 5, God is saying to Israel here, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. The covenant that God made through Moses was a covenant of governing precepts and principles. Ever hear of a guy named David from the Bible? God made a covenant with him. David is best known as the teenage shepherd boy who pulled the greatest upset of all time when he knocked out a giant named Goliath. Several years later, David became Israel's most revered king. And one day, God promised him this, I will maintain my love to him forever. And my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his love forever, his throne, as long as the heavens endure. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. You see, the covenant that God made with David was a covenant of kingdom power. Now, many of you are probably aware that the Bible itself is divided into two sections. And those sections are called the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the word testament is interchangeable with the word covenant. So we could just as accurately call those two sections the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The old covenant was based on obedience to laws and observance of a sacrificial system that required the blood of animals to atone for sin. But those rituals of the old covenant were themselves a way of foretelling that a new covenant was coming, one through which the Lamb of God would shed his own blood to pay the ultimate price for the sins of humanity. Now, perhaps the difference between the old and new covenants could best be explained like this. The old covenant was about Jesus. The new covenant is Jesus. The old covenant was about Jesus. The new covenant is Jesus. Friends, listen, Jesus fulfills every covenant in the Old Testament. The New Testament says Jesus is the seed of Abraham. He's the son of David. He's the fulfillment of the law, and baptism into his name is a symbol of life preservation and renewal like the flood of Noah. The writer of Hebrews stated it like this, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant how is the new covenant of Jesus better than the old? For one thing, under the old covenant, sins were covered. And people had to continually offer sacrifices for sin. Under the new covenant in Jesus, sins are canceled. The debt of sin is repaid in full by the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Furthermore, the old covenant was conditioned upon human behavior, requiring people to live up to the demands of the law. It was only as good as the people were good. In contrast, the new covenant is unconditionally based upon God's grace. When we accept Jesus as Savior, we enter into an eternal covenant with God that is not based on anything we do. The old covenant basically said, we amass a pile of good deeds. One day we show them to God and hope he lets us in. The new covenant says Jesus amassed a perfect record, and when we believe in him, he promises to come in. And we receive a pardon for our past, a purpose for our present, and a promise of our eternal future with God. Friends, we access these benefits and blessings solely on the basis of what God has already done for us in Christ. The gospel is not a presentation about what you need to do to go to heaven after you die. The gospel is a proclamation about what God has done to get heaven in you before you die. Huge difference. That's why Paul said to the Colossian believers, when you were dead in your sins, And in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations. That was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away. How? By nailing it to the cross. The writer of Hebrews expands this thought by telling us that God sealed this new covenant and made new life in Christ possible by the power of the resurrection. Take a look. That's how the, the letter to the Hebrews ends. May the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, God has taken the initiative to reach out to you to enter into an eternal love relationship with you. He wants you to know him. He wants to be in a covenant with you. I read of a story of a man who walked forward at a Billy Graham Stadium crusade many years ago. He said he was ready to accept Jesus. He told the person who met him, who was counseling with him, he said, that sermon was just for me. It had my name on it. Well, Billy Graham had just preached a powerful message on John 3, 16, one of his favorite texts. And the counselor said, I can see why you would think that. A lot of people think that about that verse. The man said, no, you don't understand. My name is John. I've been married three times. I got 16 children. See, God really does love me. My wife told me not to tell that joke. (laughs) The Bible is the story of our covenant God loving us so much that he gave his one and only son to die on a cross as the sacrifice for our sins. And when we respond to God's love and enter into a covenant relationship with him, he promises that we shall not perish, but we'll have eternal life. And from that moment on, your covenant relationship with God through Jesus is the foundation for all of your other relationships, especially your marriage, which brings us back to the myth we're addressing today. And some of you are saying, as a fascinating Bible study, I thought we're here to talk about marriage. Well, perhaps the best known and most quoted passage on marriage in the Bible is what Paul wrote in a letter to the church at Ephesus. And in one section of the letter, it's in one chapter, chapter five, he is detailing as he goes through the chapter What a person filled with the Spirit of God, what a person filled with the Spirit of the resurrected Jesus looks like. And and he really details that in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. I'm not going to read that, but I urge you, you should read that section. And then right out of that section, he shifts to talking about husbands and wives. But before he does that, he has a very interesting connecting idea that precedes and really frames his whole discussion about marriage. And it's in chapter 5, verse 21. Here's what he says. Let's read this out loud together. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Can you read that one more time? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, Paul is saying here, don't miss this, the last mark of a person filled with the Spirit of God is a loss of pride and self-will that leads a person to serve others humbly. From this Spirit-empowered mutual submission, Paul moves to specific ways wives and husbands relate to each other. This is huge. Paul is pointing out that at the heart of a Christian marriage are two people who are in submission first to Jesus, who, by the way, submitted himself, gave himself away, and descended into greatness. And that's how Paul starts this whole chapter. Verse 1 of chapter 5, go back and look at that. He said, follow God's example. 
Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ who loved us and gave himself up for us. Husbands, pause right there. Take note of that phrase. That's the same phrase he's gonna tell you in just a moment when he describes your role, who gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Something significant to understand that comes from this passage is covenant requires sacrifice. Covenant always requires sacrifice. All through this passage is the idea of this covenant Jesus made with us, and he did it by giving himself up and away for us. He sacrificed himself. And listen, if you don't understand that, if you don't live out of that, then you won't understand and apply this passage on husbands and wives in the right way. Because only when we see the humble submission of Jesus Christ, the spirit-empowered way of life, his sacrifice enables us to live, and the mutual submission that we are to have for each other out of respect and reverence for his submission, then these words make perfect sense. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, remember that phrase? And gave himself up for her. See, here, here's the point. Whether we're husband or wife, we are not to live for ourselves but for the other. Don't miss what Paul is doing here. He's applying a general relationship principle to a specific relationship, husbands and wives. And the principle is all Christians who really embrace the gospel undergo a radical change in the way we relate to other people. In another letter to another church, Paul bluntly says that a Christian should, in humility, consider others better than themselves. Let me ask you a question. Husbands, do you think that applies to your wife? Wives, do you think that applies to your husband? Here's another letter. He wrote this. We should not please ourselves, but rather we should please our neighbor for their own good to build them up. Why should we do that? For Christ did not please himself. Question, if you're married, who's your closest neighbor? That would be the person to whom you're married. Listen, every relationship principle in the New Testament always, always, always points back to Jesus and how he loved us and gave himself up for us and sacrificed himself, which is the heart of a covenant relationship. One more scripture to look at. And he, Jesus, died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And of course, the raised again phrase is talking about when death was arrested that we just sang about, talking about the resurrection. Friends, the resurrection is undeniably the most important event in history, and it was meant to be given more than one day a year to commemorate its staggering series of events. It was meant to be lived out every day of the year by people who enter a covenant of grace with God through Jesus Christ that changes their lives and empowers their living in such a way that people see in them the risen Son of God. The resurrection isn't about going through annual rituals that connect us to an irrelevant religion from the past. The resurrection is the culmination of the revelation of an eternal covenant that equips us with everything we need to do God's will, to live in relationships of grace and love and power and hope that changes us from the inside out and please this awesome relational God who created us to live in unbroken community with him and with others. In short, the resurrection is about inviting people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus and allowing the power of his resurrection to transform every other relationship in your life, including and especially your marriage. Several years ago, I served another church, and I started a, a marriage series on Easter Sunday. That was a little bit different. I understand that. And some people were not crazy about that. They were a little critical. And someone said to me, John, why would you want to emphasize a marriage series on Easter? I said, it's very simple, because there's a lot of dead marriages that need to be resurrected. <laughs> there's a lot of dead marriages that need to be resurrected. I have found that to be even more true today. Friends, when we enter and abide in an eternal covenant relationship with God through Jesus, listen, so what I want to talk to you about. We can build lasting relationships with our spouse and our children and our friends. Covenants of love established by God are designed not just to endure, but to endear. And isn't that what you want? 
Here's the truth. Sooner or later, we're all going to realize the only thing that's going to matter in our life are going to be the relationships in our life. That, that's just, you're, we're all moving that way, friends. The only thing that's going to matter in our lives are the relationships in our lives. Everything else is going to fade into insignificance. I read a book recently by an author named Lance Witt. The book is titled Replenish. And he tells the story of being on an airline flight with a quite elderly lady. He said when she got the baggage claim, her husband was sitting on a bench waiting for her. He said um, when the husband saw her, he just lit up like a Christmas tree. With cane in hand, he moved toward her as fast as his arthritic legs could carry him. And he said when he got to her, he kissed her like a newlywed. He said it was an awesome sight to behold. Here's what Lance Witt writes. He said, I don't know what kind of life this couple shared. They might have had a successful business. They might have been poor as dirt. Could have made a lot of money. Might have been famous for all I know. But now they're in their twilight years. Their looks have faded. Their physical strength is diminished. There's no fanfare upon her return. There's no limo waiting. There's no media. There's no spotlight. There's just one person to greet her. But it was the one person with whom she'd shared her life. They have each other. And that's enough. In all my years of ministry, I've never heard one dying person say, I wish I'd closed that deal back 10 years ago. I never heard one person say, I wish I could have lowered my golf handicap by about six more strokes. I've never heard one person say, I wish we'd installed that new flooring in the kitchen. You know, the kind that looks like wood, but it's really porcelain tile. Oh, man, I wish we'd have got that. What I have heard is tearful laments over relationships that have been neglected, time, time that's been wasted, and a God that was never enjoyed. Because one of the greatest sins of the human race is we give ourselves to those things that do not ultimately matter while neglecting those things that do. And here's the greatest irony of this whole covenant deal. I told you earlier that the covenant that God made with Noah was a covenant of life preservation. The covenant that God made with Abraham was a covenant of future blessing. The covenant that God made with Moses was a covenant of governing precepts and principles. The covenant God made with David was a covenant of kingdom power. I didn't tell you the nature of the covenant that he made through Jesus. The new covenant he made in Jesus was a covenant of passionate pursuit, not a human pursuit of that which is sacred, but a divine pursuit of that which is treasured, you. You. You are God's treasure. You are his beloved in Christ. He delights in you as a groom delights in his bride. You matter to God more than you can even imagine. You see, here's what I've learned. It is one thing to explain what Jesus did. There's a lot of people who do that very well. They can diagram the doctrines and connect all the passages. They can present the fulfilled prophecies. They explain how ancient covenants work. However, why God did it can never be understood apart from love and grace. The method of salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, they're well-known events. The motive of why God would do it can never be grasped without experiencing a love that is not logical, a love beyond reason that can't be outlined in a sermon, and it surely can't be defined by a contract. It can only be experienced in a covenant relationship of love. And so Paul Back to him, Ephesians 5. He brilliantly concludes this wonderful section about marriage in this Ephesian letter with his amazing words. Here's what he said. He says, this is a profound mystery. What is a profound mystery? This dynamic of self-giving love for the sake of the other that marked Jesus and all who follow him. This submission competition where one spouse races to serve the other. This is incomprehensible apart from the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus. Friends, that's why the gospel helps us understand marriage and marriage helps us understand the gospel. Because covenant is the heart of marriage and sacrifice is the heart of covenant. Paul is saying marriage is not 50-50. No, what he's saying, it's 100-100. Several years ago, Good Housekeeping Magazine asked people to describe their marriage, and they were doing this contest called a happy marriage contest. And the winning couple was from Alabama. And here's how they described their marriage. We gave when we wanted to receive. We served when we wanted to feast. We shared when we wanted to keep. We listened when we wanted to talk. We submitted when we wanted to reign. 
We forgave when we wanted to remember and we stayed when we wanted to leave. So husbands and wives, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That doesn't sound like a 50-50 deal to me. That's a far cry from a you owe me contractual arrangement. This is not a consumer-based relationship we can walk away from when it no longer meets my needs. This is covenant conduct that is rooted in a greater covenant that saves our world, radically transforms our relationships, and meets our deepest need to be fully known and totally loved. And that's what God offers us in the new covenant through Jesus. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Let's pray together. So, Lord Jesus, we submit to you. The one who submitted to the Father's will. And we acknowledge your death and resurrection is the guarantee of a better and greater covenant. One that cancels our debts, strengthens our hearts, energizes our lives, and assures our future. Lord, would you help us understand and apply the concept of covenant to all relationships, especially our marriages? And may we see that marriage is not a 50-50 deal. It's a 100-100 all-in deal modeled after the sacrifice of the Savior who gave himself up and away for us. In his name we pray, Jesus, amen.